probably the A.D. 60s. Consider these arguments. If I can lower my electric bill by installing LED lights in my kitchen, would it not lower my electric bill even further if I installed LED lights in every room in the house? If I know a little bit about painting, not art, but painting, and I paint the interior walls of my house and it improves the look of my home, would it not improve the look of my home even more if I had a professional painter do it? If I pray one day and it improves my relationship with God, how much more would my relationship with God be improved if I pray every day? If I study my Bible one day and it helps me deal with a tough situation at work, how many more tough situations will I be able to deal with if I study every day? In ancient times, Jewish teachers often used a how much more argument when they were trying to prove a point. And the purpose of this was to show that if a lesser point applies, then how much more does the greater point apply? Last week, we began our study of well, two weeks ago, we began our study of Hebrews. Last week, we went through chapter 1, and it was pretty evident that the Hebrew writer loves this style of writing, or this argumentative style. Tonight, we're going to see him use it to its fullest. At the end of class last week, uh, very quickly, because we ran out of time, we saw that not only is Jesus greater than the forefathers of the Jews, not only is he greater than the prophets, in verse 4 and the following verses, we see that he's greater than the angels in both name and inheritance. Real quickly, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I just want to mention it. I, I kept asking myself as I was putting the study together, why does he feel the need to compare Jesus to the angels? And I did some research on that and found a, a few people would say, well, the Jews during that time worshipped angels. Or perhaps they, and, and I looked that up and I can't find any evidence that that's true. And then I saw some things that people, some people think that maybe Jesus was an angel. And uh, so I researched that and found some people do, but that idea came around in the 1800s, not in the 1860s. So why does he think he, why does he feel the need to show a how, use a how much more argument with angels? I think it's probably because Angels were revered by the Jews. They did bring the law. They were very instrumental in God's plan. And he's just, in case those ideas come up, he, he's taking care of it with this argument. In the remainder of the chapter, he uses mostly some Old Testament scripture to prove uh, what God has said about angels in the past and talks about how Jesus is greater than they are. In verse 1 through 3, we learn that Jesus is the appointed heir of all things. He's the radiance of God's glory. He's the eternal creator of the universe. He's the sustainer of the universe. He's our sovereign Lord, and he sits at the right hand of God with all things under his authority. We know he's greater than the forefathers, he's greater than the prophets, and he's greater than the angels. To summarize chapter 3, think of it in three sections. You got verses 1 through 3 that explains how Jesus is greater than the forefathers and the prophets, and because he is greater, it's his voice that we need to listen to, and it's his voice that we need to obey. Secondly, think about verse 4. It tells us that Jesus is greater than the angels because he is the heir and son of the heavenly Father. And then the rest of the chapter would be the third section, and that's the Old Testament scripture that supports the statement made in verse 4. So in chapter 2, the writer continues the thought about angels. This week, as time allows, we're going to notice this in chapter 2. Being careless with the word delivered by Jesus, the heir and the son, can bring dire consequences. We're going to focus on that mainly in our study tonight. But we're also going to notice that Christ, not the angels, died for everyone we're going to notice that the saved enjoy special fellowship with Christ, not with angels. We're going to notice that Jesus, not the angels, defeated Satan. 
We're going to notice that it's necess it was necessary for Christ to become a man in order that he might suffer as a man. Angels have not done this. And he did this so that he might be perfectly qualified to act as our propitiation for, sin for, for us. We're also going to notice because of that, he's the perfect high priest, not angels. He understands our issues and needs better than anyone. And we're also going to notice that he's been tempted in all things, just as we've been tempted. There's no record that that's occurred with the angels. I don't know who Billy Riggs is. He's a motivational speaker. I ran across something he wrote. I want to share it with you. I'm going to read it because it's long and I couldn't memorize it. Uh, but it's very appropriate for the section of Scripture we're about to look at, which is Hebrews chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. On July the 9th, 1960, a middle-aged resident of Buffalo, New York, named James Honeycutt, took the 17-year-old daughter and 7-year-old son of a co-worker for what he assumed would be a pleasant, scenic boat ride on the Niagara River. The children's mother wasn't entirely comfortable with the idea, but Mr. Honeycutt was her husband's boss, so what could she do? She merely insisted that her children wear life jackets. As he had done many times before, Honeycutt pulled his 12-foot aluminum skiff which was powered by a seven and a half horsepower Evan Rude mo outboard motor, five miles upriver from the falls and put in at Grand Island Dock in Beaver Island State Park. The children donned their life preservers and the three of them put it out into the river. Then, for reasons that will never be known, James Huddycutt shut off his motor. Maybe he wanted to enjoy the scenery. Maybe he wanted to enjoy the peace and quiet. Perhaps he wanted to chat with the children without being drowned out by the motor's uh, roar. Or it could be that he saw no point in expending valuable fuel to take them where Mother Nature would certainly carry them for free. The three talked and drifted for about an hour and eventually floated under the North Grand Island Bridge. How many of you know what the significance of the North Grand Island Bridge is? That's the marker that serves the locals who frequently float above the fall, boat above the falls as the unofficial point of no return. Sometime later, James Honeycutt decided that it was time to start his motor, turn around and head for home. But he soon discovered that that seven and a half horsepower was no match for the mighty Niagara. Even at full throttle, the boat continued to creep backward. The situation went from bad to worse when the overtaxed propeller was ripped completely off the motor. Honeycutt grabbed two oars and began to row mightily toward land, fighting the most powerful waterfall on earth with only his biceps. As they entered the rapids above the falls, the boat struck a rock and capsized, throwing all three into the turbulent, frigid waters. The teenage girl clung tenaciously to the boat, and when the torrent finally wrested it from her grasp, she found herself not terribly far from Goat Island, which is a huge landmass in the middle of the river that separates the American Falls from the Canadian Horseshoe Falls. A 44-year-old New Jersey truck driver who just happened to be viewing the falls with his family from Terrapin Point that day spotted her and began to scream to the girl to fight her way to the island. You're fighting for your life, he recalls shouting to her. At great peril to his own life, the man climbed over the rail, thrust his left foot tightly between its bars, and dangled precariously over the cascading waters by that one leg in an attempt to reach the terrified girl. As though scripted by a Hollywood screenwriter on the child's third desperate lunge, she managed to grab the man's thumb just 15 feet before she would almost certainly have plunged to her death. Another onlooker climbed over the rail, grabbed her by her life jacket, and pulled her to safety. By now, her little brother had long since disappeared over the precipice. Experts later conjectured, that because he only weighed 46 pounds, the momentum of the water must have flung him far out beyond the falls and the jagged rocks below so that he landed in deep water. When he shot to the surface, courteous of his life jacket, he was spotted by a crew member of the Maid of the Mist, the boat that routinely ferries tourists to and fro at the base of the falls, and rescued. he was rescued with only a mild concussion. Roger Woodward, that's the little boy, is now in his mid-60s and remains to this day the only person who has ever gone over Niagara Falls unintentionally and survived. The entire episode is still known among local residents as the Niagara Miracle. But 
there would be no miracle for James Honeycutt. His body was found three days later when it surfaced just a quarter mile down the river. Okay, I'm going to continue reading, and he's going to talk about careers and life things, but I want you to think about the application that he makes to these types of things in a spiritual sense, especially in the context of what we're about to read in Hebrews chapter 2. James Honeycutt perished because he drifted too long, carelessly assuming that he could fire up his motor and reverse course any time he pleased and successfully fight the current. His story serves as a parable to all who float through life carefree, deluding themselves with the notion that one day, not today, but one day, I'll get serious about my career, read everything I can find on sales or leadership, and begin to fight for my place in the world. Sometime, not this time, but sometime, I'll start to pay attention to my spouse and romance them as I know I should. But I'll worry about that later. In the future, not in the present, but in some nebulous future, I'll take my diet and exercise regimen and cholesterol levels seriously. When I get around to it, not now, but when I get around to it, I'll begin to spend meaningful time with my kids. But careers not actively being built have a way of becoming dead-end jobs. Marriages become unsalvageable. Health, health issues might insta instantly develop into irreversible conditions due to stroke or heart attack. Kids grow up and move away, carrying with them the memories of either being adored or ignored by their parents. The consequences of inaction, now think spiritually, the consequences of inaction have a way of accumulating like so many snowflakes into massive snowdrifts of regret. They take on a life of their own and gradually imperceptibly become irresistible, immovable, permanent, like plaque on your artery walls. They build up silently and unseen, grow deadlier by the month. Beware the seductive attraction of some day, lest you discover that the growing momentum of life's circumstances, the ever-increasing inertia of a neglected relationship, and the cascading flow of untreated health issues, each conceals a point of no return a time beyond which all of your greatest efforts might prove insufficient. The sad fact of life is that it is almost impossible to stand still. For circumstances will always pull you downstream whenever you are not expending the energy required to fight the current. It takes effort. Now think about this spiritually. It takes effort just to stay where you are. It takes all the horsepower you can muster to fight the current and go where you want to go. Your goals will always be upriver, so every day that you drift takes you farther from your destination and makes your journey longer, harder, and more improbable. Life doesn't get better by chance. It gets better by choice. Now let's read Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witnesses or witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. How many of you can tell that that's a video? You just thought it was a picture, didn't you? Look at it carefully. You can see the water moving, barely. I videoed this last summer. Uh, this is the Yellowstone River. And I was standing there on the bank, and you can't see it, but against that rock wall over there, there's some ducks going by. It was a real peaceful day. And I remember standing there thinking, I wonder who the first person was that come down this river in a canoe or a raft. And I wonder if they had any idea of the danger that they were headed towards just a few miles down the river. How many of you know what that is? Now you can tell that's a video, can't you?
This is not Niagara. This is the Yellowstone River. And uh, in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 2, we notice that the word delivered by angels proved to be true and authoritative. That's your lesser argument. Those who violate it receive swift and just punishment. Now here's your greater argument. How much more? How much more important is the word delivered by God's own Son? The appointed heir of all things, the radiance of God's glory, the eternal creator of the universe, the sustainer of the universe, our sovereign Lord, who has everything under his authority as he sits at the right hand of God. There's your much more argument. And then he says, how much more severe will be the punishment for those that carelessly handle the word of truth as delivered by the Son of God? That word that was delivered by angels carried retribution if it wasn't obeyed. So how much more serious is the retribution that comes by disobeying uh, the Son of God? It takes determination. It takes effort. It takes obedience. It takes knowing the Word of God and adhering to it. We all know it's impossible to work our way to heaven. We will never deserve it. We will never obtain it on our own. It is a gift from God, but it is a gift that we can lose if we are careless in our faith and in our obedience to it. Being a disciple of Christ demands that we fight those subtle currents that would take us away from our spiritual goal that only lies upstream. Downstream is not where we want to go. And it's impossible, if we went back to that video of the Smooth River, it's impossible to get on a, a raft or an inner tube or something and to just stay in one spot. The river is going to, the current is going to take you where it wants to go if you, just, if you don't exert any effort, is it not? Being a disciple of Christ takes great effort to simply stand still, spiritually speaking, and not drift backwards. How much effort does it take to make our way upstream? If it takes a lot of effort to just stay where we are, how much more effort would it, does it take for us to go upstream against the currents of life? Because we're running out of time, I wanted at this point to ask you what the currents of life are, but we'll just go right ahead and I'll go through the ones I've got here. The first one is, the first current that can cause us to go downstream is the current of time. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 through 10, Paul wrote the Galatian church, he said, Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in the due season we will reap if we do not give up. If we get tired of swimming in that current and we decide to rest, what happens? It, we start going backwards. It starts moving us. We must never rest on past accomplishments. We must always strain forward. Paul understood that. He said in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 13, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. And let us hold only let us hold true to what we have attained. Paul understood. You can't take a break. You're never going to make it in this life. You're always going to have to be straining forward to, toward that prize. So the current of time is something that we have to always strain against. Also, the current of famili familiarity. We must never take those words of Christ for granted. They must never become old hat to us. They must never become, uh, I've heard that before, I don't need to hear it again. They're always appropriate for us. We must never lose our love for the Word. Revelation 2 and verse 4. Uh, we talked about that in the devotional tonight. Another current is the current of society. Modern opinions, if we let them, can sway us in the wrong direction. They can take us downriver. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, Paul wrote, Do not be deceived. Bad company runs what? Good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. They think they do, and they would sway us that they do, but we need to be careful that the current of society does not take us downstream. 
Also, we need to be careful about the current of the flesh. Peter understood this. In 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse 11, he said, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Our internal desires, our physical desires, our physical wants will try to pull us downstream. In Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16, Paul wrote, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires, desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For those are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. And what do we want to do? We want to go upstream. We want to strain towards that prize. We want to go forward. But it takes effort. Finally, the one that probably most of us deal with every day is the current of daily concerns. The thing, you know, the living thing. In Luke chapter 8 and verse 14, this is the uh, parable of the sower, or the parable of the seed, however you want to look at it. Jesus said, As for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. Again in verse chapter 21 and verse 34 of Luke, he said, but watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and what cares of this life that, that, and that that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. The cares of life can seduce us to pray less, to study less, to fellowship less, to worship less, because we just don't have time, do we? because we're dealing with other things. The cares of life can, if we're not diligent, cause us to stop swimming upstream. And what happens when we stop? We begin to drift toward the destruction that waits all who are careless with their spirituality. But thank God, we do not have to fight the current alone. Christ will help us if we pay attention to his message. We must always look into Him and never forget the hope that He provides. For it, that hope is our anchor, Hebrews 6, 19. And as long as we keep our eyes fixed on Him, Hebrews 12 and verse 2, our anchor will hold and we won't drift. The key is Jesus, not the angels. And we must be obedient to Jesus in all things. He said this in John 15. Verses 9 through 10, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Hebrews chapter 2, first few verses are not a pleasant thing to review. It's not a thing we like to think about. But it is possible for us to drift. How far can we drift before the point of no return? That's a good thought right there. I like that. Did y'all hear that? We don't want to play with fire. We don't want to be like the guy in the boat who thought he had time, because we really only have, we may not even, we really just got it, we may not even have an oar, we may be paddling with our hands. Uh, so we need to assume that we can't drift very far at all, or we're going to be in trouble. It's different for each individual, I'm sure. Can we know if we're drifting? We can, it, definitely we're supposed to obey but, and remain faithful. That will keep us from drifting. But suppose we have drifted. How do we know? Each one, we're told to examine ourselves, right? Why would he tell us to examine ourselves? Why would Scripture say that? We have the ability to know. But how do we know? What is that ability?
There you go. We're told to look into this like a what? What is this for us? Like it's a mirror. It's a, it's a road map, but it's like a mirror. If, it, if we look in the mirror, and what we see in our life matches what we see in the mirror, or if our life matches what's in the mirror, we're probably not drifting. But if we look in the mirror, and what we see in our life, you know, if we see things that don't match up, we probably ought to make a course correction. That's the only way I personally know that you can do it. Anybody got a different way of knowing? But definitely we can know. We can find out. But if we're careless, if we're careless and we don't look in the mirror, another way to say that is that we don't study, we might drift and not know it. And then one day when we might go over the fall. So we always, that's why the word is so important. That's why the writer here is talking about what's the first thing he says? Pay attention to what you have heard lest you drift away. That's a good point. Paul talked about the Bereans who studied daily to make sure that what they were doing or what they had been taught was true. And we and this, that same thing should apply to us as well. Let's uh, very quickly in Hebrews, let's read the rest of the chapter and then I'll make some points about it. Uh, I encourage you to study it on your own. He basically is going to talk about the humanity of Jesus. It all supports uh, why he's greater than the angels. Uh, but let's begin in verse 5. For he has not put the world to come, of which we speak, in subjection to angels. But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. Now, is that not a confusing way to say something? But now we do not yet see all things put under him. And he just added more confusion on top of confusion. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Anybody have a different word than captain? Author, anybody have a different word than that? Some versions will use the term pioneer, uh, forerunner. Think of it that way. That's more what it means in the Greek. It's a, a pioneer or a, first, a forerunner for us, is what it's talking about. Verse 11. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, that's us, saying, I will declare your name in my, to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death, that's us, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham, and the seed of Abraham is the church. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things, pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. And the angels can't do any of that. And that's the point he's trying to make. There are a few things to think about. I, I, I promised myself I would give you back some of the time I took the first two weeks. But I might have to do it next week. In verses 5 through 9, what he's talking about here in a roundabout, confusing way is man originally had dominion over the earth. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, at the beginning, God gave that dominion to Adam. 
Uh, Dave, David marveled at this, that God has sent man over his works in Psalms 8 and verses 4 through 6. But we sinned. Uh, we lost some of that dominion. And, but Jesus, through his humanity, by becoming a man, he regained that dominion for us. He was made a little lower than the angels, meaning he became a man. He suffered a death, a cruel death, and he was crowned with glory and honor. What man once had and lost Jesus has regained. And we share in that rule both now and in the future. In Ephesians 1, verses 20, says that Christ rules over all. And then Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 6, talks about how those in Christ sit together with him, especially so when we pass from this life to the next, Revelation 2, and verse 26 and following. So that's what that first section is, is talking about. Jesus had to become a man in order that he, help, he get, regained that dominion. And we share in that as his brethren. He's not ashamed to call us his brethren. Uh, beginning in verse 10, going through verse 13, talks about how his sufferings in the flesh were appropriate. They were fitting. Uh, they made him perfect for the task. And perfect here does not mean uh, sinless. It means complete, effective, adequate. He was the complete sacrifice. He was the most efficient sacrifice, the most adequate sacrifice. He was the perfect sacrifice. Uh, and that because he was complete and effective as our Savior and High Priest, uh, that's why his sufferings were necessary. And, we'll, and, it talks, and then it segue, that segues into the next section. In verse 14 through 16, we see that he has conquered death for us. Of course, he had to suffer first. He had to die, but then he was raised uh, from the dead, conquering, that, conquering death uh, and delivering us from the fear of death. Now, what do you think that means? We've got time to ask that question. The fear of, why do we, do we fear death? No more? We have no reason to fear. If we have faith and we believe, we have no reason to fear. Now, we fear dying, but maybe not, but we shouldn't fear death. Jesus' death gave us freedom from that fear. Uh, Romans 8, chapter 37 through 39, 1 Corinthians 3. Philippians chapter 2 all talk about this, how we, the faithful Christian, need not fear death. Uh, and it's to the seed of Abraham. And if you read Galatians 3, 29, Paul very plainly states who the seed of Abraham is. It's Christians. Uh, they need not fear that death. And that, that's because of what Jesus did for us, not because of what the angels did for us. And then at the end of the chapter... Uh, or almost in the chapter, verse 17 to 18, we see that he's our sympathetic high priest. He's merciful. Uh, he became a man in all things, which equipped him for the role, the perfect high priest in things pertaining to God, so that he might make propitiation for our sins, which is what the high priest used to do in a, uh, in a temporary sense. And we'll talk a lot about that in an upcoming chapter. And then, of course, we know he was tempted in all manner that we was, and because he was tempted, because he too suffered in that way, uh, it makes him perfect to understand us and to plead for us, and which is what he's doing on the right-hand side of God. Uh, and that completes chapter 2. Any questions? Comments? Okay. Then let's have a prayer. And I hope everybody has a safe trip home tonight. Be careful. It's raining. And uh, we'll see you all again on Sunday morning. Let's, have, let's pray, please. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the writings that we've studied tonight. Thank you for the, the blessings that we see. And also thank you for the warnings, Father, that we need to adhere to. Help us, Father, to study your word and to comply with it, to make changes in our life, to model ourselves after the life of Christ. Help us to know his words and apply them in everything that we do. We thank you so much for his death, his burial, his resurrection, and the hope that that gives us. It anchors our, our faith, Father, and we can know that we can be saved as well, and we will be resurrected as well. 
Father, we ask that you'll be with those that were not here tonight and ask that you'll help them to get well, that they might be back with us. Please bless us as we go home and keep us safe. And we ask that you'll forgive us when we sin. In Christ's name we pray, amen.